Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're rebinging Star Trek Voyager from the very beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the pod. Today, we are kicking off our re-binge of Star Trek Voyager, starting with Caretaker, Episodes 1 and 2, which aired as a two-hour special, January 16th, 1995. This is it. This is the beginning. This is the new podcast. <laughs> this is what people have requested. I, actually, I, I don't know if they really requested it, but it's what we wanted to do. We got a few requests as well. Before we get going, just a little bit of housekeeping. You may be listening to us on the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager feed, and that's great. Or you may be listening to us on the Rebinge It feed, and you're thinking, why are there two podcasts? Well, there are two because Rebinge It will contain all of Star Trek Voyager plus any other content that we produce. So Star Trek Prodigy, for example, will appear in the Rebinge It feed when it starts up, and the Star Trek Voyager feed will only ever have Star Trek Voyager. I know that's confusing, but that's how it is. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Yeah. The other thing we should do before starting is just reintroduce a little bit about what we're going to do in this podcast. If you're unfamiliar with Rebinge Deep Space Nine, our previous pod, here's what this podcast is all about. Okay. What we will do is walk through each scene in the episode, and then we will comment on it, discussing the highlights, and maybe even Kim will comment on the hair, which has caused some amusement in the past. <laughs> but the idea is to give an overview of the episode and discuss major points of it. And there will be over-analysis, looking into the deeper meaning of what's going on. And of course, we cannot stop James from headcanon. So he <laughs> will definitely have moments of headcanon in his over-analysis. And then I like to talk about the portrayal of women in the future. That was a big thing on Rebinge Deep Space Nine. So I want to do that again, because there actually uh, are a few more women characters on this show from the beginning. And I believe I'm going to add a new category to this show called Janeway's Leadership Corner. Yes. Kim likes leadership. It's a subject close to her heart. Yeah. And we're just starting on this one, so we're not sure exactly how much detail we're going to go into. We did a lot of detail in Rebinge Deep Space Nine yes. on each and every scene because I'd never watched it before. And it seemed important that we pay a little bit closer attention. Yeah. Now, both James and I have watched Voyager, though it's been a very long time since I've watched it. So a lot of this is going to feel new to me. Yeah. But we're just probably not going to do quite as much of a deep dive on each and every scene. We're going to try and streamline it a little bit, but still get the essence of the scene and anything that's important. Yeah. But we reserve the right to change. We changed a lot on Deep Space Nine, <laughs> right? We'll probably do it again. Yes. We'll see what works. The show will evolve as we do. Right. Ideally not into salamanders. Oh, Lord. We'll also try and avoid giving spoilers of future episodes for the simple reason of we don't know if everybody listening has watched it. Yeah, that's true. We definitely had people who were watching it for the first time with us on Deep Space Nine. So I'm going to assume we'll have some people who haven't watched Voyager before. So I think that's a good idea. So I won't bring up in season six, episode 12, how Tom Paris dies. <laughs> Do you even know what season six, episode 12 is? Not a clue. Just make that up. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't happen. We will definitely try to avoid those big spoilers. <laughs> Although we can't get away from some of the jokes like the salamander. There will be recurring jokes. Yeah, of course. All right. We've babbled long enough. I think we should get started and, and talk about this episode. So should I get into the show then? Yes, please. We open on a scrolly detailing how, because of the terrible treaty with the Cardassians, the Federation colonists have banded together and formed the Marquis to fight the Cardassians, because they were all hung out to dry by the Federation who did a terrible job. Yeah, we talked about that a lot <laughs> when that treaty was signed. Yes, it's a big thing from Deep Space Nine. If you'd watched Deep Space Nine, you'd know all about the Marquis. Yeah. Some consider them heroes, but to the Federation and Cardassian governments, they are outlaws. So dramatic. Oh, yeah. We immediately go into action with a Cardassian ship shooting at a small, but really cool looking ship. And I think we saw these in Deep Space Nine before. Like as Marquis ships? Yes. Mm. On board, we immediately see three of the main characters of the show, but we haven't been introduced to any of them yet. It also looks really cramped in there because there's also like two NPCs doing stuff in the background <laughs> in what looks like something smaller than a closet. Yes. This crew appears to be a human with some kind of face tattoo in command, a Vulcan, and what also appears to be a Klingon, although her teeth seem pretty good, so that's pretty un-Klingon. 
Yeah. Well, they're getting beaten to crap. There's lots of shaking and they're trying to make it into the Badlands, which, again, if you'd watch Deep Space Nine, you know, is an area of space where there are like lots of plasma storms. And we learn that the Vulcan's name is Tuvok. Well, they managed to make it into the Badlands and we get some TV special effects of these plasma storms, which by modern standards looks a little iffy. Yeah. And one of the storm towers takes out a Cardassian ship. They're safe for now, but Tuvok reports they've just passed through some kind of coherent <laughs> Tetrion beam. And we get the very first iteration of some kind of on this iteration of Star Trek. Right. And it happens numerous times in this episode. <laughs> yes. I know Harry Kim says it a few times. Oh, they embrace it. Yep. Well, things just keep getting worse for them as now a massive displacement wave is accelerating towards them. They try to get away, but they can, and everything goes white. And again, if you were a follower of Deep Space Nine at this point, you'd be asking, are they in the Celestial Temple? <laughs> Do you remember every time Cisco would have visions and things, it would all go yes. white, like in the same way? Yeah. First over analysis point for this show. Do you think they were doing this deliberately as a misdirection for the Deep Space Nine viewers? Because it's like when you go to the Temple of the Prophets. <laughs> I didn't think so. I actually think they're working pretty hard to not be <laughs> Deep Space Nine on this show. Yeah. But it could be. Uh, maybe. Maybe the caretaker's a prophet. We're already into Kim headcanon. Okay, I like that one. <laughs> Probably not, though. So into the opening credits, and we get the first introduction of the Voyager theme. This is actually a really great opening. It's orchestral. Mm -hmm. It has no singing, which is the important thing for Star Trek intros. Right. It very much reminds me of the style of the Deep Space Nine opening, you know, from season one to three. Mm -hmm. More than the later one, which was a little bit fancier, I think you described it as. I think this is my favorite theme of all the shows. Yeah. Outside of maybe the movies. Movies are a little bit different, but I do love the theme song for Voyager. DS9 season one to three. That was my favorite intro. <laughs> I mean, it is better than the one that they introduced later. I know, right? And perhaps I've just been unobservant, but at 410, Voyager flies over an icy looking landscape. And I never registered that that's exactly like the opening of Lower Decks, where the Cerritos <laughs> flies into an ice mountain and like the lights go out and things. It's totally a spoof of this. And I never noticed it before. I assume there were lots of jokes from the opening shows and the Lower Decks opening, but I never looked into it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I never, I didn't notice that either. What I said earlier about us not going into as much detail, I might have to retract it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great opening. And I think Voyager is just a really good looking ship. Yeah, I never paid much attention to the ships, but I think Voyager is my favorite ship. The way it looks is quite sleek. Yes. You can't get away from the sort of iconic look of Enterprise. Yeah. You, even though they've changed it multiple times, it still has that same sort of look. That will always be close to my heart as well, but I do think Voyager is a pretty cool looking ship. Agreed. Back to the show and trying not to turn this into a Deep Space Nine podcast. Right. It's going to be hard. I mean, yeah. it was just last week we were recording <laughs> that one. <laughs> we did it for three and a half years. Right. We get a change of scenery to a Federation penal settlement in New Zealand. And I thought they were supposed to ship the criminals to Australia. Oh, they filled it up. Oh, OK. We see a guy working on some equipment and we hear Kate Mulgrew say his name, <laughs> Tom Paris. And the camera pans up to see a very strident Janeway standing in full uniform who just announces Catherine Janeway. That is a Kira level of confidence pose there. <laughs> Hands on hips. Yes. Standing straight as a board like Kira always did. Exactly. Yeah. So she's there to offer Tom Paris a job, help them find a missing marquee ship in the Badlands. And we get a hint of Tom Paris's luck as he was only with the marquee for a few weeks before being captured. <laughs> I'd say it's pretty fortunate he didn't get captured by the Cardassians. Janeway explains the reason they want this ship is because her chief of security was on it in an undercover role and has failed to report in. And it was also commanded by a former Starfleet officer called Chakotay. Apparently, Chakotay is a bit of an idealist and was fighting for his colony and didn't like Paris, who was just a mercenary, as he says, willing to fight for anyone who'll pay his bar bills. I believe the polite term now is private military contractor. I, I don't think you're allowed to say mercenary anymore. Mm. We also learn here that Tom has an admiral for a father. Yes. I'm sure he's very proud to have his son in <laughs> prison. 
Yeah, yeah, a Federation prison. Yeah, well. Well, being a mercenary, Tom has no problem helping them find his marquee friends. Janeway tells him, help us, and when it's over, you'll be out of jail. Off to a shuttle, and Tom Paris is hitting on the pilot. Oh my god. She's not uh, interested, what? and Paris <laughs> obviously skipped the workplace harassment briefing. Maybe because he got kicked out of Starfleet. And he's only here, like, as an observer, right? He's not supposedly a member of the crew. Right. But it is a terrible invasion of this person's space. Oh, yeah. He's a very close talker. There's a lot of times during this episode where I wrote down close talking was going on. <laughs> but yeah. at this point, I mean, he's like a new Bashir, but a little bit more of a bro, which is not impressive. Yeah. Come on. Why is he in uniform as well? He's like in a full Starfleet uniform with the badge and everything. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If he's just an observer, why would they put him in a Starfleet uniform? Yeah. Well, the shuttle arrives and we see they're at Deep Space Nine. Voyager (laughs) is docked at one of the pylons at the station. And we learn she is an intrepid class ship, 15 decks, 141 crew complement. And we get a lot of techno babble, but we do get the introduction of bioneural circuitry. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. But it came up, I think, when we were talking about Prodigy, right? Yeah. This was like a new technology they introduced. I guess it was all to give an idea that Voyager was something new, that it was leading edge. It was different. Or cutting edge. Mm -hmm. It's a great flyover of the ship as well. It really does give you a good overview of just how beautiful it is. It may, however, be eclipsed by the Protostar. Well, they blew that up, so (laughs) Protostar only had one season. And we cut straight to Morn in Quark's bar. So a nice little crossover between the shows. (laughs) And we're introduced to a new young ensign who Quark immediately tries to rip off. Fortunately for this guy, Tom Paris is there and points out how Quark is basically selling worthless rocks. I really like Tom Paris in the background just drinking his rack to Gino and looking over his cup at what was happening. (laughs) I don't know what it was about that scene. It was just the way he was doing it. Like he was going to sort of stand there and see how deep in trouble the ensign got before he stepped in. Yeah. I, I don't know. That was really cute. It was a good scene and Quark very much played up that sort of Ferengi nature. So if you knew the character from the other show, this fitted very well. You know, this thing that he does in the scene where he shows outrage. You know, Harry Kim says something about, oh, we learned about Ferengi at the Academy. And, you know, Quark already knew about this. Oh, completely. But, you know, he launched into this, you know, how he was just horrified by this and he was going to call. I don't remember. Was he going to call his commanding officer? I don't remember. He was going to do something, right? He was was pretending like, yeah, he was making a big fuss. He was pretending like he was going to call his manager, basically. That made me think of, you and I were talking about this recently, that I have worked with people in the past who they're like on the attack. And then you say, I don't want to say who, but you say something back to them. And then they act like you have murdered them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like this weird yeah. sociopathic behavior right. that I cannot understand and relate to. And that's what I thought of in this scene. It was like, oh, that's like just exactly what Quark is doing. That so fits with Quark. I mean, in the number mm-hmm. of times in DS9, he went to, I'm the victim here. Yes, yes. Well, and maybe this is normal, but I mean, he doesn't really take anything personally. He just pretends like he Oh, does. yeah. It's all part of the act for him to make the sale. Yeah. Which Tom ruined. So Harry and Tom leave, and it looks like Tom's made a friend, or Harry's made a friend. Yeah. And we go straight to Voyager, where we meet the medical officer, who is best described as pretty hostile towards Tom. Doesn't like Tom. (laughs) Why would they report to the medical officer? (laughs) I don't know. I guess maybe it was just protocol. You had to make sure that your medical records had been received or something. Oh, okay, okay. But I was wondering, because there's a lot of distaste for Tom Paris in this episode. Yes. And I was wondering, maybe it's because they know how he treats women and they don't like it. (laughs) Like, knock it off, dude. Ah. As they walk, Harry wants to know what the deal is with Tom. But Tom just brushes him off saying, somebody will tell you before too long. Oh. We now get a quick scene with Janeway talking on comms to her partner and about how her dog is pregnant. And this guy seems like a pretty good partner. He seems to care about Janeway and her pet. And quite forebodingly, she says, I'll see you in two weeks. Oh, poor Mark. He seems like a good boyfriend. Yes. But we're not going to see much of Mark. (laughs) Spoiler alert. (laughs) Not the only one we're not going to see much of. Tom and Harry now arrive at the bridge, and Harry seems to be a bit taken aback by everything. He's kind of rubbernecking on the bridge. And we meet the first officer, Commander Cavis, who's also very frosty towards Tom. Harry seems to get very confused with Janeway calling her sir, ma'am, and everything instead of captain. Don't you think Janeway at this point's going, why do I get them? 
Well, I bet that's normal, though, right? Because he calls her sir. She says, I don't like sir. And I was sort of annoyed by it going, well, wait a minute. It needs to be the same for everyone. Yeah. But then when he calls her ma'am, she's like, I don't like that either, right? Or she says, only in crunch time. And she just wants to be called captain. And I thought, you know, that is the right thing because that's the gender neutral term. So I'm with her. Just want to be called captain. Yeah. The first officer in this scene who's also quite frosty to Tom. Yes. He is either like the same actor as the guy who played the doctor. I mean, it, remember, <laughs> we were watching this and we went, wait a minute, is that the same guy we just saw? Except now he has a beard. Change shirt. The two guys look a lot alike. Yeah. But don't get too attached. The ship's ready to leave and we get a great effect shot of Voyager pulling away from Deep Space Nine. And I didn't notice this before, but the same woman who piloted the shuttle is now piloting the helm. Yes. I did notice. Now that they're underway, we go back to the mess where the doctor and first officer are talking to Harry and giving furtive looks over at Tom. Oh, yeah. It's like at a lunch table at school. Harry asks Tom if it's true. And we learn that Tom got three officers killed in a flying accident. Pilot error. That was his fault. He then falsified records to cover it up, but came forward and actually admitted it. For this, he was kicked out of Starfleet, joined the Marquis, and on his very first mission, he got caught. (laughs) There's such a funny parallel here between the character he played in TNG, who was a pilot who got people killed and got kicked out of Starfleet. But that's what made it so confusing, right? Because they used the same actor and they had the sort of same story. Yes. It was easy to think, oh, this is the guy from that show. But no, right. it's an entirely different character. They brought that original character back, though, on the latest season of Lower Decks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he didn't uh, quite disappear into the ether. But yeah, that was really funny. It's like, why did you use the same story? We don't actually know why he confessed. And when Harry asks him, he makes a cynical response that the dead officers came to him and taught him the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So they're also trying to give yeah. Tom Paris this little bit of a cynical edge, yeah. although he seems very upbeat. He does have an edge. Well, it's a little bit of a sarcastic edge. Yeah. I do think we get a little bit of a hint that there's more to this story. Yeah. But realistically, when he sort of tells it like that, he doesn't come off that badly in it. Like his first reaction was to protect himself, but then he came forward. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, it, those sorts of things happen. The beginning of the scene is Tom getting into an argument with the replicator about tomato soup. And that, too, is something that I think is quite memorable about Tom Paris. I don't know why. (laughs) Maybe just because it's something that happens in the pilot. But the computer's like, there are multiple kinds of tomato soup. He's like, oh, my God. And then when he finally gets his tomato soup, he doesn't like it. Yeah, I think the point of this scene was to start establishing that friendship between Harry and Tom. Yes. Yeah. I think as well to show that even though he doesn't seem that much older than Harry, Tom is a much more worldly wise, a much more cynical individual. Uh, Yeah, for sure. Well, and this is Harry's very first mission, first time out of Starfleet Academy. So he is pretty young. And he does say something here that, you know, he's not going to let other people tell him who he can be friends with. Yes, I thought that was a nice touch as well. Yeah. Maybe Harry can see the good in Tom. Well, this is a good example of that sort of... Roddenberry thing where there shouldn't be any conflict between people. But here's a conflict right here where you've got these other two guys talking in Harry's ear and trying to talk him out of, you know, like, watch out for that guy. He's going to be a bad influence on you. And Harry's just like, meh. (laughs) I'll make my own decisions. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back to the bridge and Voyager's flying through questionable 90s special effects, also known (laughs) as the Badlands. Tom's giving some advice about where the ship they're looking for probably went, and it seems like he has a lot of knowledge for the Marquis after just a couple of weeks with them. Yeah. So did they have a training manual? Did he fully study it or something? Well, maybe as a pilot, he did have some extra oh, info. Oh, that's a good point. He might have to know all the places where to go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, the Cardassians claimed the ship was destroyed because it's always somebody else's fault with the Cardassians. That is, yeah, that is true. I'm sure the captain, after getting his ship damaged, probably had several underlings to blame for how it wasn't his fault. But before they can really do anything, Harry detects they're being scanned by a coherent Tetrion beam, and a displacement wave is moving towards them, just like the Marquis at the beginning of the show. And we get a second, some kind of, as it's a polarized magnetic variation. And when Harry says that this wave is heading towards them, Janeway's reaction is, on screen. And I'm like, on screen? Run! What you... <laughs> Something is coming at you. <laughs> That's a very Star Trek what? reaction. Oh, That's she's... a Star Trek captain's reaction. Oh, let's have a look at it. Yeah, let's see. And then she's like, analysis. I'm like, no, first you get out of the way. Then you analyze it. 
while it's gaining on them and they can outrun it. And Janeway orders brace for impact, and then they're hit. And the idiot first officer runs across the bridge after she says, brace for impact. (laughs) He's immediately killed. It's like, dude, that's on you. We get some quick VFX of Voyager getting hit, and briefly everything goes white. Profits again. (laughs) And back to the bridge, where we see they've taken serious damage. Stuff is hanging from the ceiling. Janeway's bun has started to break down, and her hair's falling apart. She is really good in this scene, I think, when she climbs up from the floor. Well, first of all, she sees her first officer dead on the floor and just holds his hand, which is like a very tender, just instantaneous moment. But also she is still in command. She's frazzled. Yes, her bun has come out of control. Her first officer is dead. Something terrible has happened, but she is still in charge. Oh, yeah. I like that about Janeway. We also see that the woman at the helm's dead as well. They've definitely taken casualties. I did like here how, despite his lack of experience, Harry is still managing to maintain composure and he's getting systems back online and he seems to be doing a pretty good job for first mission guy. Well, because leadership, that's what his boss did, right? She got up, started doing her job immediately, and he got up and started doing his job immediately. Despite a collapsing bun, she was still able to carry on. (laughs) Although he does say, Captain, there's something out there. I'm like, come on, Harry. (laughs) Well, they get the view screen online and we see the array, which just looks like a giant space station. Yeah. And the big bombshell of the show drops. Harry reports, we're over 70,000 light years from home. We're on the other side of the galaxy. Dun, dun, dun. I think there was a dramatic ad break there. (laughs) There might have been. Back from the ad and things aren't getting better. The engineering chief is dead and we didn't even get to meet him. He probably looked like the doctor and the first officer. Oh, (laughs) good. It was the same actor. He just had like a different shirt on and they gave him a a beard. Yeah. Yeah. Then maybe he had a goatee. Oh, yeah. There you go. Of course, they're about to have a warp core breach. Yeah. Janeway heads off to engineering to help and Tom and Harry head to medical where they're getting no response. And they basically find medical on fire and they're all dead. We won't be seeing the doctor again. That's true. Harry pulled out the fire gloves here that we saw in the first season of Deep Space Nine. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen him before or since. (laughs) <laughs> they were left over from the Vantica episode. Yes. So they've killed off three of the people we've been introduced so far. We've lost the doctor, we've lost Helm, yeah. we've lost the first officer. Engineer, although we never met him, but still. Yeah. yeah, everybody's down. If you're not in the main cast, I wouldn't be feeling too good about things right now. <laughs> yeah, right. In engineering, Nigel Roddenberry is warning everyone that a warp core breach is imminent, and Janeway just takes charge. Yep. Back in medical, and Harry initializes the emergency medical hologram. And for the first time, we see the holographic doctor, who seems immediately aloof and (laughs) has something of an attitude. A little salty. Yes. I did laugh in this scene when he asks for a tricorder, and Harry gives him a tricorder, and he's like, oh, a medical tricorder. (laughs) That's another example of where the device can only do one thing, which is such a Star Trek thing. It's also funny to see a hologram like that be this salty. I mean, did we even see that in TNG? Mm -mm. I mean, the closest we've really seen was um, Moriarty. Well, Moriarty was more like how we might picture an AI. Who yeah. took up a personality and you know, yeah. because he lived inside of a villain, basically. Yeah. Whereas this guy, what we learned in Deep Space Nine was that this doctor, we learn it later, but this guy was based on a real person. Yeah. On the salty personality of a real person. <laughs> Tom and Harry are, it's like they're playing straight man to the new doctor. Yes. Who is just very funny. Meanwhile, Janeway is down in engineering trying to save the ship. It's like, come on. In engineering, Janeway, is, of course, has saved the day. I love that she's such a good engineer. But as it's Star Trek and things just have to keep getting worse, and the bridge reports they're being scanned by the array, and the crew just start disappearing. They're being beamed away, leaving just the holographic doctor alone in the sickbay. Inside the array, the crew find themselves in, quote, some kind of holographic projection. <laughs> well, it looks like an outdoor party on a farm. The party host is very friendly, and she has sugar cookies, live banjo music, plus dancing, and it all looks like something from the rural south in the 1930s, or at least the idealized, stylized version of it. I was going to say maybe a movie. Yeah. Harry and Tom set off scanning, and despite a hologram attempting to distract them, Harry picks up life signs inside a barn. But the hologram starts turning nasty, actually punching Tom and knocking him down. Well, his stunt double anyway. (laughs) And the others all appear, wielding pitchforks. They're really leaning into this hillbilly vibe here, I think. Yeah. 
the host from earlier tells Janeway, as no one's interested in corn, we'll have to proceed ahead of schedule. Sounds a little ominous. And at the back of the barn, we see a corridor stretching out into the distance with what looks like hundreds of bio beds with people in them. And we see the three crew members from the start of the show with what looks like large needles sticking out of the Vulcan. The needles are a bit much. Yeah. And as they stand there, everyone's beamed away, and we get a really nasty montage of needles being stuck into Mm. Janeway and Harry while they're conscious. And they're screaming, and yeah, that was a bit much for me. So there's some alien probing going on. (laughs) Yes. At least they've improved from where they would traditionally probe people. Yeah, that's a good point. Nobody wants to see that. Cut back to Voyager, and the crew are now waking up, and we find they were on the array for three days. Plus, Tom finds Harry is missing. On a positive note, they did find the Marquis ship, though. Where did they find that ship? Was it just floating around? Yeah, it was by the array and it was powering up his engines. Mm. Well, Janeway hails the ship and we learn the guy in command is called Chakotay. And one of his crew is Balana Torres and she is missing too. They agree to work together and the Marquis beam over. And on the bridge, the Vulcan tells Chakotay, I must inform you, I was assigned to infiltrate your crew and I am Captain Janeway's chief of security. I thought that was great. And what's odd is how Chakotay doesn't respond to this. It's like, the guy you've been working with is an undercover agent of Starfleet. And you're like, hmm, whatever. And then when he sees Tom Paris, he goes into this whole rant about Tom Paris doing it for the money. And it's like, um, the guy standing right next to you just betrayed <laughs> you to Starfleet and was no. lying to you the whole time. And you're like, fine. But Tom, Tom's a mercenary. I don't like him. No, he seemed annoyed about Tuvok. In fact, he just called him Vulcan. Yeah, but his reaction to Paris was so different. It it seemed like an odd directing choice. Yeah. I think I'd be equally annoyed at both of them. Well, and even maybe more so with Tuvok, because he was actually lying about who he was. Right. You knew who Tom Paris was. At least he was an honest mercenary. Remember when we used to just beam people into ops on Deep Space Nine? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Why are we beaming them onto the bridge and letting them turn up with their weapons. Oh, that's right. They all turned up with weapons. Drawn. There was that thing on an episode of Deep Space Nine. I want to say it was like to the death or something. It was one of the Jem'Hadar episodes where they beamed the Jem'Hadar over. And Cisco gave like some secret protocol code. And then when they beamed over, their weapons were taken away. That's right. It's like, why didn't we do the same thing? I just thought that was crazy that we would beam them over with their weapons right onto the bridge, pointing their weapons at the captain. Come on. Only Cisco knew the code, I'm afraid. Oh, it's a secret Cisco yeah. code. All right. Secrets. <laughs> so I think this scene establishes that the Vulcan is actually one of Janeway's crew and Tom Paris and Chakotay do not see eye to eye. Yeah, Janeway steps in and this is another example of where we have the close talking where she is right in Chakotay's face. <laughs> Well, Janeway goes back over to the array to look for Harry and get some answers. Tom volunteers. Obviously, Tom, there's something about him. He's actually going to stick his neck out for his new friend. Yeah, his only friend. And we find the only person left in the hologram is an old guy playing a banjo who seems pretty crazy, telling him they don't have what he needs, but they're missing crew might. He's not making any sense. And he says he has no choice. He must honor a debt that can never be repaid. And his search has not been going well. He keeps repeating that he doesn't have enough time and just waves his hand, sending them all back to Voyager. This guy clearly isn't playing with a full deck. (laughs) And he has an awful lot of power that he can just send them back to their ship by waving his hand. We also see that the big array, it's sending out some kind of pulse. Yeah. There's so much walking around on that fake planet. I mean, we just see them walking constantly and Janeway has this just really intent march. Where yes. she is just really waving her arms and just, you know, marching really seriously. And it, uh, I almost should have gone back to time how much time we spend walking around. <laughs> we now get a quick scene of Harry, who's in some kind of medical facility. <laughs> and he's got lesions on his hands, arms and chest that look really nasty. Good special effects. Also, the Klingon woman from earlier, she is there too. It all looks really sort of disconcerting. Yeah, because it's all white and very bright. We get a quick log from Janeway explaining that the pulses are going to the fifth planet of a nearby system. Tuvok is now back in uniform, and they discuss that the planet is M-class, but there are no nucleogenic particles in the atmosphere, and it is incapable of producing rain. They conclude there must have been some kind of environmental disaster there. Also in this scene, Janeway really displays her concern for the missing Harry, 
talking about his family and how yeah. he left his clarinet at home and his mother wanted to ship it to him. And she also says for the first time that she needs to get her crew home. Clearly, empathy and responsibility are high on Janeway's profile. Yeah, this is where some good acting comes from Kate Mulgrew in that yeah. we can see, she says it, but we can also see it, that she yeah. regrets not having enough time to get to know the crew. And that was something, of course, that Picard realized at the very end yes. he needed to do. Right. Janeway is starting at the beginning knowing that she wants to do that, needs to do that, but she's immediately burdened by knowing that she's not responsible for getting all these people home again. Right. I also like the interaction with Tuvok here a lot. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Where she describes his family as worried and his response is, that would not be an accurate assessment. Vulcans <laughs> do not worry. I really enjoyed that. And, and I liked how when she says to Tuvok, I'll get you back to them. That's a promise. The way she says it is like drop dead serious. Yeah, she's really good at going from an emotional moment to the really stern moment. Right. Yeah. Off to an FX shot, a Voyager and the Marquis ship, and they're moving through a vast debris field. And we get introduced to an alien called Neelix, who seems very friendly and who knows the story of how they were whisked away from somewhere else in the galaxy against their will and says that it is done by somebody called the Caretaker. He says that this is what the Acampa call the guy who runs the array, and they live on the fifth planet in the system, and it's not the first time crew members have been kidnapped. He agrees to help if they can pay him in water. And they beam Neelix over. And the first thing he does is hug Tuvok. (laughs) Tuvok seems sort of irritated. Is that the right word? Or just sort of... Uncomfortable. That Vulcan thing. Yeah, sort of, oh, it's an emotional being. But also he does say that perhaps he would like to have a bath. (laughs) Yes. Maybe Neelix doesn't smell the best. And he's wearing like this big fur coat. And I immediately shuddered. I was like, oh. Oh, geez. Yeah. That must smell bad. (laughs) Poor Tuvok. And the guy hugged him. Now the smell is on him. (laughs) In the medical facility, Harry is introducing himself to the Klingon woman. This is Belana Torres. She's very fiery, blaming it on her half Klingon nature. She keeps calling Harry Starfleet, which I think is pretty funny. One of the guys from earlier brings them some clothes, telling them that they're honored guests sent to them by the caretaker and then takes them out to see the rest of the city, which is this vast subterranean city, and tells them how they've lived there for 500 generations. Oh my gosh, and I didn't realize it was that long, but they do say a millennia later. They keep asking this guy questions and he knows nothing. He doesn't seem to know very much. They're like, what's wrong with us? Why do we have these things on us? Oh, we don't know. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, no, really, you don't really know very much. And you know, there were some other people like that. Well, what happened to them? Well, we don't know. They're dead. (laughs) It's like, okay, dude. What do you know exactly? What's the caretaker? We don't know. We've never seen him. Yeah. What does he want? We're not sure. Um, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this guy goes on to explain how they used to live above ground until the surface turned into a desert and the caretaker came along to protect them. He built the underground city for them and it provides for all their needs. I got this sense here. Balana gives this kind of look. I'm not sure whether it was sort of like, oh, interesting coincidence. Your planet turns into a desert right when this guy turns up. Oh, yeah, that could be. I thought what the funny look on her face was because all those people were congregating behind them. Oh, yeah. And she was getting uncomfortable. But this place looks like a 1990 shopping mall. (laughs) I kept thinking, like, did they film this in the Pasadena shopping mall or something? I was getting a real Logan's Run vibe to this place. Hmm. But as you said... They don't know really anything about this disease, but they just know that they need to care for the people who are sent to them by the caretaker. We just hang on to them till they drop dead. And none of them ever recover. (laughs) I'm just like, oh my god. On Voyager, Tuvok, who obviously has drawn the short straw, goes to check in on Neelix, who seems to have eaten the entire menu from the food replicator. (laughs) And I kept on thinking of Jank and Pog from Prodigy. Oh, yeah. Not as funny, though. Jank and Pog is hilarious. Yeah. I was thinking in this scene because you can hear Neelix do, singing like some <laughs> weird thing from the Stuff tub. In the bath, yeah. It reminded me of that documentary we watched about parrots. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. And there was the one who learned how to sing by hearing somebody sing through the wall of an apartment building. And so it was really muffled and weird. <laughs> and that was like, Neelix is like, la, da, 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 da. like, what is he singing? It does beg the question, though why you would allow an unknown alien on your ship, unsupervised, without at least a guard at the door. Well, there might have been a guard there. 
Maybe Tuvok dismissed him and then went in. That's a fair question. I was also, though, struck by now he's just wasting water. He's like drinking it and then spitting it into the bathroom. I'm like, don't waste it. What are you doing? We just got thrown 70,000 light years from home. We don't even know if we're going to get home. We shouldn't then allow this Jankum Pog wannabe guy to come in and waste our resources. Good point. Well, Neelix does give them directions to find a very specific settlement on the surface of the desert planet, and they beam down. And here we meet the Kazon Ogla for the first time. Neelix explains how the Kazon sects control this sector, trading food, water, and ore, and perhaps ominously, and they all kill each other for it. (laughs) And they're all sunburned, and they all have crazy, ridiculous hair. Yes. And they seem very cranky. It's probably from the sunburns. You know, I didn't think about that. Janeway could have solved the whole problem if she'd just given them an air conditioning system. Or, you know, some kind of ointment. Oh. Some, you know, some sunscreen. Yeah. She could have revolutionized their society. A little aloe. Yeah, she could have changed the whole, the whole course of things if she had <laughs> just come down there with some aloe instead of some water. I mean, come the on. The Kazon were a violent, aggressive race until they got air conditioning and good sunscreen. That's right. Did you notice when they beamed down, they were all facing different directions? What was that about? Oh, it was their tactical pose. Oh. Charlie's Angels. <laughs> Charlie's <laughs> Angels. Okay. I'll accept that answer. Well, immediately the Kazon take them prisoner, but Janeway gets them out of trouble by beaming down two vats of water that they seem to use as currency. And we see in the background there is an Ocampa woman who looks very beaten up. Yeah. The Kazon leader, Jabin, explains how the Ocampa live underground, but there is a barrier they cannot get through, and they don't know how this woman escaped to the surface. Neelix suggests trading water for the Ocampa woman, but when this fails... He grabs the Kazon leader, holding a phaser to his neck. The crew take back their weapons, and Neelix shoots two holes in the big water container. While they're scrabbling to save the water, the Akampa woman runs to join Neelix, who strongly suggests, Janeway, get them out of here. And they beam back to Voyager. Back on Voyager, Neelix tells the strange woman, didn't I say I'd save you? And Janeway looks a little shocked. Neelix. She's been conned. Lying right out of the gate. This is not how you establish a good relationship of trust. Well, we also learn here that the Ocampa only live for nine years. Yeah, that's strange. So how old is she? So what, are they born fully formed? I mean, this is weird. Yeah. They should have done like 20. Nine was dumb. I have some overanalysis. All right. So they say nine years, but we do not know what the orbital period of the fifth planet is. Okay. And if we make the assumption that the fifth planet is maybe in the same position as on our solar system, which would put it out by Jupiter, that means one year of Jupiter going around the sun is 11 and a half Earth years. So if you look at it like that, that's like a hundred and something is the maximum age. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. But the Kazon, I don't know what that means about the Kazon. Do they also live in the same planet? Because they would, then the time would be different for them too. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So their definition of what a year is could be different as well. But maybe they live to be a thousand. <laughs> oh. <And> so, <laughs> so, okay. All right. So the use of the word years could be uh, kind of a variation depending on what planet you're on. Okay. Let's see what happens. I don't remember what happens with the cat story, but nine years seems dumb at this point. But I take your point. Nine years could really be like 99 years in human terms. Back to the underground city, and one of the medical staff tell Balana and Harry the caretaker has been acting very strangely. They have enough power stored in the city to last five years, and also that some of the younger people in the city have broken away from its norms, and one person even left, but was never seen again. So once again, that theme of young people (laughs) rebelling against ordered society. Oh, yeah. The young people are the problem. In the sick bay, the EMH is attending to the stranger camper woman, and she convinces Neelix to stay and help the crew. And she tells them there are breaches in the security shield, which they may be able to exploit. I like it when the doctor tries to get everyone to leave sick bay. (laughs) And Janeway just says, End program. Oh, and the look on his face. Amazing. (laughs) So funny. I mean, he's obviously there for comic relief. Poor EMH. Because he's so straight, yeah. In this scene, Kess is the one who's really reasonable, and she is, yeah. you know, she tells Neelix, oh, no, we're going to help them because they rescued me. And he's like, no, but I rescued you. And she's like, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> and Yeah, Neelix is that guy. Wasn't this a brilliant idea of mine? Yes. And uh... It's funny that she's supposedly a child. You know, she's the young one, but Neelix is always the one who is childish. 
Immediately we go to the underground and the Acampa woman leading Janeway and her crew through what looks like a market garden where they're growing vegetables. I was very confused about this scene. Like, how did we get here? Right. It was an immediate cut from sick bay to this. Yeah. We do get to know her name, which is Kess, when one of the Acampa greets her. And we also learn that apparently they are telepathic. Oh, right. Well, one of the Acampa elders turns up, telling Janeway they can't have their crew members back because they can't interfere with the caretaker's wishes. And Kess's wig is looking not great in this scene. No, the wig is pretty weird. It's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Kess now gives a speech about how the elders have become so dependent on the caretaker for so long they can no longer think for themselves. Hey, after Kess's speech, when she's just basically like, I don't care what you think and you can't stop me. <laughs> and she walks off and the camera goes to Janeway, who does this look to the guy like, Puh, take that, dude, and just walks <laughs> off. I had to rewind and watch that like five times. It was so funny. This to yeah. me, it, it's like, you know how there's the Riker move, right, where he has to put his leg over the chair to sit oh, down. Yeah, yeah. And there's the Picard move where he's straightening his shirt. This is the Janeway move. I'm going to pay attention <laughs> to see if she does this again because... That was iconic. The Janeway maneuver. It's the Janeway maneuver. <laughs> While this is going on, Harry and Bolana have found a staircase leading to the surface. Uh, but they're having a lot of trouble because the illness keeps getting worse. There's a great little bit of interaction between Bolana and Harry, where it turns out she was at Starfleet Academy for two years. And although Harry is despondent that he's going to die in his first mission, Bolana tells him they're not done yet. So she's sort of pushing Harry to keep going. You know, I hadn't seen this episode in, I don't know, 20 years. It's been a long time. Yeah. And I have to say that the stairs are my lasting impression of this episode. <laughs> How much time do we spend on these freaking stairs? <laughs> this is just the first scene where we get there, but we are on these stairs for so long. It's like that was the thing I remembered about the episode. The stair climbing episode. The stairs. Well, the array suddenly stops sending these energy pulses to the planet, and then it turns and starts firing at the energy conduits. Tuvok develops a hypothesis that the caretaker is dying and that he believes he owes something to these people. Hence the phrase, the debt that can never be repaid. And this comes in the middle of more marching. Now we, oh, are, yes. we are back in the Pasadena Mall because yeah, we're going up an escalator at one point. Yep. This is hysterical. And then we are marching. They're trying to get to Cinnabon. And the Saboro. And the Claire's gifts. And I mean, they're just doing that thing again where they're just walking and walking and walking yeah. and walking. And Janeway is just marching. Oh, yes. It's so funny. Janeway does bring up the good point as well of if he dies, how the hell are we supposed to get home? That's a great point. But also, how from underground now are we able to communicate with Voyager? Although it doesn't work here, but she said it had worked, I thought, before. Yeah. But before we couldn't even see the underground on the sensors. Well, they were exploiting the gaps in the oh. shield that Kess had informed them about. Okay. Which now the guy was trying to seal up the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a little foggy. Well, Tom, Neelix, and Kess have found Harry and Balana On the stairs. <laughs> We're back at the stairs. Yes, and they have to climb the stairs to get to them. Meanwhile, everything is shaking from the weapons fire where the caretaker is trying to close the power conduits. Mm -hmm. They do make it to the top, though, and Kess leads them through a gap in the barrier. And using phasers, they cut a hole to the surface and we see them climbing out. Well, the stairs are now collapsing. Yeah. And although Janeway and Tuvok make it out, Paris goes back to help Chakotay. And there's some questionable dialogue here regarding Native American customs, which... Oh. Which seems wildly inappropriate. I don't know. It was it was the 90s and like in the same way that we don't know how to treat women in the workplace in the 90s, we clearly yeah. didn't know how to speak about Native Americans. I mean, there's a big story about this and you know, we can talk about it in the over analysis too, yeah. but I'm sure people know this, but they didn't hire a Native American actor. I think Star Trek tried to do the right thing by having a Native American character, and they also hired what they thought was a Native American consultant. Oh, yeah. But that person turned out to be a fraud. But ultimately, Robert Beltran, who plays Chakotay, is not a Native American. So why they didn't just hire a Native American actor, I mean, that's the dumb part of this whole story. It's like you yeah. could have probably saved yourself a lot of grief if you had done that. But instead, they hire him, and then they hire some consultant who was uncovered as a fraud even before they hired him on this show. Yeah. So huge mess, huge mistake. And there are some really inappropriate things said about Native Americans in this episode and then I know later as well. 
Anyway, we've been on the stairs for about 15 minutes now. It seems longer. Because in my notes, it's like we started at 104 and now we're like at 115. Oh, dear. We are in the stairs for so long. Well, the good news is Tom does manage to rescue him amidst a dramatic stairs collapsing effect. Oh, yes. Right at the last second. So you'll never have to see them again. Why didn't they just knock those stairs down in the first place to prevent people from going up and down them? Chakotay does have a good line here, telling Tom, at least I die, I'll have the pleasure of watching you go with me. Yeah, I did like that. (laughs) Apart from the specific things that they were saying about Native Americans, I did like their interaction, where they were not cool with each other. On Voyager, the Doctor has cured Harry and (laughs) Balana. Yeah, with no fanfare. Boom, we're good. They're fine. We don't hear what even the problem was. Well, the Kazon have arrived and start attacking Voyager. They're basically pretty unreasonable people. It's the sunburn. They are not happy. And we get a bit of a space battle as Janeway and Tuvok head back to the Array. And Chakotay battles the Kazon. Meanwhile, Tom Paris gets his dream job as Janeway orders him to the helm. Oh, I love it when when she says, you have the con. He's like, (laughs) oh. On the Array, the hollow farm is still running and Janeway goes to talk to the crazy old banjo player again. (laughs) And we learn some crazy batshit stuff in this scene. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, he tells Janeway that they were explorers from another galaxy, and it was an accident that their technology destroyed the Ocampa planet's atmosphere. Two of them stayed behind to care for the Ocampa, but the other one got bored and left, <laughs> leaving him alone. <laughs> and they make a point of saying she. Yeah. So like, yeah, she didn't want to do it anymore, so she moved on. <laughs> uh. He explains he wasn't deliberately infecting people. He was searching for a compatible biomolecular pattern. Janeway brings up, He was trying to procreate. Yeah, but she's like, you were trying to procreate like that? Yeah, there was that. Oh, it's very... And he's like, yeah, that's the only... That is the absolute only thing I could do is his answer. And you think, really? You couldn't have moved the Ocampa to a different planet? What what are you talking about? (laughs) I have some overanalysis on this. Okay. Well, he says he was trying to find someone to replace him to continue to care for the Ocampa. This, I think, is probably the best Janeway part. She gives him this great classic Star Trek speech about how, given the chance to grow and set their own path, the Ocampa can survive and evolve, telling him, maybe your children will do better than you think. And I thought it was a really good little scene. Although she doesn't take her own advice later in this episode. She doesn't? No. Why? Well, because she chooses to stay behind to help the Ocampa, not taking her own advice of just letting them survive themselves. Oh. But this scene, it felt so crazy. Like, what was the guy doing with the needles? Because he's trying to procreate. (laughs) Is he trying to, like, is he doing artificial insemination? (laughs) Is that what's going on with those needles? Oh, that's really unpleasant. I know that's what I'm telling you. This scene was crazy. Or was he extracting something and then trying to do something in a test tube? But I don't think so, because then why did he send Harry and Balana off to this other planet? Like, we sort of gloss over the details of what was going on. Here's my headcanon on this. Oh, I love the headcanon. He was looking for a compatible species that maybe he could genetically modify into basically an, oh. another version of himself. And what was happening was Balana and Harry had a similar enough matrix. He tried the experiment on them and they basically became infected. The process didn't work. Although, huh, uh, okay. So they became infected with something. Yeah. Why couldn't he cure them with the power that he has? Instead, he ships them off. I have more on this. Should we continue? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. This is what you're here for, people. The James Head Cannon. Here's the problem, which I think at its heart is part of the issue with this character. Because I looked at all these things and went, what, what is he doing? <laughs> I think he's suffering from cognitive decline. Oh, he's gone a little cray cray. Yes. He's left it too long to find a replacement. Maybe the actual collapse was very quick with this race. So he's doing all these crazy things. He's being extremely thoughtless in the way he's behaving towards other sentient life forms. When we see how much he cares for the Acampa and stayed behind to look after them, the problem is his faculties are declining. Hmm. He's maybe not thinking correctly. Okay. He's making these bad decisions. I saw all of his actions excusable by the fact that you've got this extremely powerful creature who's basically losing it. All right. I will accept that. Thank you. This is when Harry calls and says, we've got problems up here. <laughs> like, come on, <laughs> Harry, yes. this, you have to be more specific when you call the captain. <laughs> Something bad is happening. Yeah, yeah come with solutions, Harry. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what I always tell people. Come with solutions. Don't just call me about a problem. 
Well, Harry's not over-exaggerating because outside, everything has gotten worse as a huge Kazon vessel has arrived oh. and is beating up on Voyager. NPCs are flying around the bridge, there's explosions, it's all the classic Star Trek. Well, Chakotay's brilliant plan is to take a leaf out of the Jem'Hadar's book and crash straight into the Kazon ship. He manages to hold on to the last second before beaming out, and his plan works taking out the giant battleship or whatever it is. As we've seen, Jem'Hadar tactics work. <laughs> yes. And the Kazan ship crashes into the array. Totally reminded me of Return of the Jedi. Yep. On the array, while Janeway was talking to the caretaker, Tuvak has been behind the scenes doing a bit of poking around and has figured out how to activate the array to get them back. But it will take hours, of course. The caretaker just says he wishes he could help, but he has very little time and he's activated the self-destruct. The enemies of the Ocampa cannot control the station. What is more Star Trek than that? Activated the self-destruct. Yeah, but there was no big dramatic countdown. Yeah, well, that was in a different room. Hmm. Tuvok was in the op center with his scanner going, the computer, it's speaking to me. Oh, that's from three, right? Yeah, search for spot. Well, the caretaker's plan gets derailed when, as Kim said, the giant Kazon ship crashes into the array and the holo program shuts down, revealing that the caretaker is some kind of computer-generated blob from 90s special effects. <laughs> Purple. He tells Janeway the self-destruct has been terminated because of the damage, but the station must be destroyed. And then he dies and appears to turn into a lump of rock. Which she picks up. Yeah. My first thought was, don't touch the rock. Don't touch that. Yeah. yeah. How'd you know it's not dangerous? Aye. And here comes the big decision for Janeway. Tuvok wants to activate the array and get them back. But Janeway is concerned about what will happen to the Acampa. Tuvok very smartly invokes the prime directive that they're basically interfering with a, another species. I think he's completely valid here. But she tells him they didn't want to be involved. But they are. Back on Voyager, Balana questions what Janeway is doing. But Janeway, in absolute classic Trek, tells her she's not prepared to sacrifice the lives of the Acampa for their convenience. Oh, I loved this. This was one of the setting the stage for Janeway. And it was Chakotay's best moment as well, maybe ever, of the character. Because yeah. Balana says, who is she to make this decision for us? And Chakotay just says, she's the captain. Right. And I was like, oh. Thank you for being useful. I love how Tuvok, when she makes the decision, Tuvok gives her his counsel and she is like, no, we're involved. We're doing this. And that's the end of it. Yes. He is like, I am trusting my captain. Yeah. The debate did not continue. Exactly. At his station, Tuvok reports they're ready and we get an awesome shot of a stern, determined looking Janeway and the camera starts to zoom in on her and she says, fire. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, this might be better than the end of part one of Best of Both Worlds, where Riker <laughs> says fire. Just this moment? Yeah. Just the fire moment? Yeah. Hmm. This might be the best example of a captain doing it. Well, you're allowed your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, Riker wasn't the captain. He was the temporary captain, yeah. In a great special effect, they then blow the station to bits. You thought that was great? I thought that was a little bit uh, questionable, that <laughs> oh, effect. It was good for the TV. Yeah. For a little TV. It's not that great for a 70-inch TV. I did like after they blow it up, the Kazon ship hails them and the guy just says, you made an enemy today and then just ends transmission. Oy, cranky pants. It was to the point, though. Yeah. No messing around. He's like, do you know how much sunscreen they had on that array? <laughs> Jeez. They might have had air conditioning. I mean, this has been going on for a million years. I don't understand. Uh, no, it's a millennium. Yeah. Well, I exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This has been going on for a thousand years, yeah. and you guys couldn't get into the array, or to just today you figured you would try, and then somebody blew it up. I don't get it. The Kazan are crazy. In the aftermath, Janeway tells Tom that she's granted him a field commission to lieutenant. He's now officially the helm, and she selected Chakotay to be her first officer. Neelix and Kask ask to stay and go with them. He offers his services as a guide for his knowledge of the sector. Hey. We should have said, no, thank you, Neelix. We could have kept Kess. She seemed useful. Janeway nods, and we cut to a flyby of Voyager. On the bridge, Janeway gives a speech, and we see everyone is now in Starfleet uniform. She tells them to survive, they need to work together. Chakotay has agreed, and they will together be one crew, a Starfleet crew. And as a Starfleet vessel, they will continue to follow their directive, to seek out new worlds and explore space. But their primary goal, will find a way back. And finally, she orders, Mr. Paris, set a course for home. And we close on Voyager jumping to warp. 
The end. It's a great speech with a Voyager theme playing in the background. Oh, yes. And it really reminded me of Prodigy. You know, when she was talking about us being one crew, it reminded me of the Janeway hologram. Oh, Prodigy is such a Voyager the next generation. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. You can't escape it. Yeah, that's definitely true. Well, we finally got to the end of the episode. Yes. A bit of a supersized episode. Do you have other over-analysis you'd like to share? Yes, I do have some over-analysis. Mm-hmm. First one. The technological level of advancement of these people seems to be all over the place. Yes. Neelix is amazed by transporters and replicators. And water. <laughs> well, I, we'll come on to that. Mm-hmm. But yet the Kazon have phasers or disruptors. Mm-hmm that are powerful enough to damage a Federation ship. Yeah, it's a huge battleship that they have, and you're telling me they can't go to another system or another planet? Right. Yeah, it's questionable. Yeah, it seemed kind of odd. Mm -hmm. But you might be able to argue here that the Kazon steal technology, so they might have good weapons and things. They didn't build them, they stole them from another ship. Or, remember Neelix was going through the debris pile? Mm -hmm. The caretaker was bringing in these other ships and, you know, like he damaged Voyager, others, they could be warp core explosions. So maybe the Kazon were pulling stuff from other ships. So you ended up with maybe. them having yeah. some technology. But you think, you know, they might have got things like replicators or transporters. Yeah. So it seemed inconsistent. But then again, probably if they'd had like super technology and things, I probably would have complained about that. Oh, this is the Star Trek thing of the super powerful mm-hmm. enemy that they need to back off on. So I guess this kind of worked. Right, right, right. I'm being a nitpicky, aren't I? No, I don't think you're being nitpicky. I I had a lot of the same questions that the technology just, it just seemed something was definitely off. Yeah. Because even some parts of the story about, you know, like how they got underground and stuff, even that was sort of a little bit hand kind of messy. Yeah. So no, I don't, I don't think you're, I don't think you're off. Okay. Next thing. Mm-hmm. They have this thing about water and not being able to have enough. Mm-hmm. From what I understand and reading up on NASA, our solar system is full of water. Water ice out in the outer reaches of the solar system. There's loads of it. Yeah. Uh, Couldn't these people with the technology of ships fly out? the ships they have, yeah. If they had just like a couple of little ships that were not warp capable and they weren't these giant, you know, warships, I think we could have had a different discussion. Right. But because they have those big ships, you have to believe they've got some kind of technology. Yeah. Couldn't they find a water world? Yeah. That seemed a little... Uh, hand wavy. Yeah, I agree. Next thing. So he's given the Ocampa five years of energy so they can keep living in their city exactly as it is for five years. And I think part of the story, which I kind of liked, was they're showing that some of the younger Ocampa, they're growing their own vegetables, they're learning agriculture again. They're giving you this impression that they're heading towards some form of self sufficiency. Right. And even Kess was talking about that. Like, we've grown to accept dependence. Yes. So Mm -hmm. you clearly see that Janeway talking to him and this idea of, look, maybe your children won't do so badly if you leave them on their own. So I think that's true. The problem they have is they have an actively aggressive, hostile race living on the surface of their planet, squatting there. So they're going to get slaughtered when the shield goes down. Already you saw the Kazon viewed the Ocampa as worthless. Yeah. So you got a big problem there. It's like, well, we do this noble thing and we save the Ocampa for five years and then they get slaughtered by the Kazon anyway. They didn't say how many Ocampa there were. Yeah. Like, could they have beamed them onto Voyager and just gotten the heck out of there? Oh, interesting point. And gone to a different planet? Yeah. I don't know. So I think the Ocampa need to really start learning how to fight first. Get some yeah. allies, because yeah, they're not looking in a very good spot here. Well, they have five years, I guess, to figure it out. The, how they, they're not going to get any allies. How do they communicate? Yeah, they need to be able to get yeah. out, and the whole point was sealing yeah. them in. I don't think the caretaker really thought out his plan. Yeah, you would think that what he would be focusing on, instead of trying to just extend their current situation, but he yeah. should have been focusing on, how do I get water back into their atmosphere? Like, he had all that technology and power. Yeah. I'm just not sure he was focused on the right thing. Digging a hole underground and keeping them there, that doesn't seem like a good, yeah. a good move. Yeah. But like you said, he was maybe a little loopy. Well, that leads on to actually my next point, which is, I think if you look at it from the terms of this guy had suffered cognitive decline and was dying and wasn't thinking straight. Right. His story becomes almost tragic. 
you almost can't help but feel sorry for his position. He's desperate. Yeah, I mean, he definitely was desperate. That comes across pretty clearly. And also the fact that the other alien had abandoned him. Yeah. No, I think that was clear. The other side of it is, if he has this technology and if he can look at people, uh, maybe that's the problem. He can't really determine things. If you ask the Federation for help in this situation, they'd be absolutely on board. It wouldn't violate the Prime Directive because an advanced alien culture from another galaxy with extremely high technology destroyed their atmosphere. Yeah, already interfered. Already interfered, caused all these problems. If you ask the Federation to help, there's no doubt they would want to do something. Again, that plays into this. He wasn't thinking straight and makes me kind of feel bad for the caretaker. Hmm. Okay. He had all those holographic friends, but that was it. That's true. And he did learn how Mm. to play the banjo. So, you know, there was something. (laughs) He he did learn how to play the banjo. Yeah. And make fresh corn. So my final summary on the Acampa here is they have four options when the power runs out. Starve to death, be slaughtered by the Kazon, revert to barbarism, or all of the above. What's your vote, Kim? (laughs) I don't know. What's your vote? (laughs) I'm going for all of the above. All of the above. I knew it. Okay. And maybe my final thing here is, so if the Acampa live nine years, and we take those as human years rather than, let's say, that it takes 11 and a half years is for one of their years on their planet. But anyway, then 500 generations would be like 3,500 years, assuming that they reach maybe about six and then have kids. (laughs) Six or seven. Hmm. Okay. So that guy's been there for about 3,500 years. That's some serious headcanon. <laughs> but could be. I'm here for the overanalysis. Yeah, you definitely are. I guess the Acampa must reach maturity like in one year or something, like a massively accelerated growth rate. Do we get more? Do you remember? Do we get more info about the Acampa? A little, it but seems like not we must. really very much. Okay, it's very strange. And that wraps up my overanalysis. And surprisingly, it did not take five hours. I don't have a lot in the overanalysis section. I did think it was funny that Harry and Belana got back to Voyager and they were cured. The end. It's like we never talked about it. <laughs> it's been a time discussing what had happened. It was just fixed. If the caretaker's technology was so much more advanced, then why did he just ship them off sick? And, yeah. and it's not, it wasn't the first time he'd done it. And then he, they get onto Voyager and boom, they're fine. That was a bit funny. Well, that's where I think you know, he was rushing. He wasn't taking care. He wasn't doing the things that he should have been doing. And yeah. that's where his decline came in. The other thing I was thinking is maybe it was just a side effect of the, for some people, his mm. invasive techniques caused these problems. Yeah. And when it came to the doctor looking at them going, oh, okay, I know what this is. It's a virus or whatever. I can cure it. This guy was trying to inseminate these two people by putting something into their stomachs. I'll just take it out. (laughs) That's kind of gross. I know, it is gross. Another one of my points we already talked about, which is sort of about the Ocampa. Why didn't the caretaker just try to find them another planet? That would have been a smart (laughs) one with all that technology, yeah. Yeah, something. If you could fire at the surface, why didn't he clear up the uh, Kazon? Yeah, get rid of the Kazon. Maybe he wasn't... The kind that would just kill or something. Yeah, but he'd kidnap people and let them die of secondary diseases. And let them die, exactly. (laughs) See that smoking ruin over there? Yeah, they used to be the Kazon. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was going to mention the Prime Directive, but I think you you covered it enough, which, you know, in saying that this alien had already interfered so much that now Janeway was feeling the responsibility of looking after the Okampa. Right. Yeah. I think Tuvok's point is still valid. Yeah, Like you, Vulcans yeah. could. You could take a very narrow interpretation and say, this is between this alien race and the Ocampa. You it, could logic your way out of it oh, to yeah. get yourself, yeah, to get yourself home. I think the Vulcans are good at that. Definitely. I think my last server analysis point that I will mention is that I'm sure it was really important to put the burden onto the captain at the end, right? So that it was purely Janeway's decision Yes, that we are going to stay. 1,000%. Yeah. Maybe one final, final analysis. Hey, my first final, final analysis, Kim. Yes, okay. Final, final, final. Now, mm-hmm. could Janeway have got some of the people home? I mean, Voyager has shuttles, right? Stuff a load of people on the shuttles Well, and then try and get them home? Well, I was looking at it a little bit differently. Like, why didn't she... 
use the array to send Voyager home and leave behind an automated shuttle to fire onto those charges that they left on the array and blow it up. I guess that way you couldn't be 100% sure, but I mean, you could have done that. Would have been the best option. I guess there's always the possibility then that the Kazon, well, she could have stayed behind and made sure that it happened, I guess, sacrificed herself. Oh, the sacrifice of the captain. Yeah. What's more Star Trek than that? But then the show would have been over. Her hologram was prepared to do that. Her hologram was prepared to do that. If they had hologram Janeway, they could have left hologram Janeway in the shuttle and she would have saved the day. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately they needed a reason to keep them in the squadron so that they would have a show. <laughs> I think that's the answer. I mean, you could make the argument here that they were running out of time. The Kazon were bringing in more reinforcements. They couldn't hold mm-hmm. the Kazon off. So it was only a matter of time before they got a hold of the array. So I could see that as a, there was a time pressure. And also there was the risk of Voyager getting destroyed. So I'll give him that. Yeah. I'm going to go to women in the future. Okay. We talked a lot at the beginning of Deep Space Nine about the angry woman trope of Kira in the early seasons, right? Maybe only in season one so much, and then they evolved her fairly well. We saw her get angry a few times later, but those were pretty justified. Yeah, moments in time I get. It's when, remember, the introduction to her, we heard her yelling before we even met the character. That's because the provisional government was full of idiots. And then there was was also the comment from Miles about all Bajoran women, you know, sort of being difficult to work with. So didn't really appreciate that. But I really felt like they evolved that character oh, and yeah, you know, I kind of got, they got over it. I got over it. Yeah. So here we are again with the angry woman trope with Belana, and she's volatile. She's angry. Right. But I will say it's done differently here in that they're giving it that element of her nature being because she's half Klingon. Yeah. And that's why she's saying it's difficult for her to temper her own temper. Yeah. <laughs> So at least that's a little bit more nuanced than just here's one of the four type of women we know how to write. Yeah. So I will I will give them that. I thought I'm glad they explained it right from the beginning, you know, that she said yeah. I'm half Klingon. And then Harry says something like, oh, maybe if I were half Klingon, I'd be tougher when they're trying to climb those ridiculous stairs. And she's yeah. like, mm, I don't think you want it. <laughs> it's like it's more trouble than it's worth. So I'll give them credit for that nuance. Do you think it adds anything into the character, the fact that she can recognize that within herself? Definitely. Self-awareness is key. Yeah. But the other thing that I will mention is Kess. At this point, Kess is a weird character. You don't know a lot about her yet. She spoke her mind, but when she spoke her mind, there really weren't any stakes. Even the other Okampa didn't really care. Yeah. It was just like, all right. So... There's this whole thing, too, about her chronologically being a child, and yet she's got this thing with Neelix, which how did she even get connected with Neelix if she was kidnapped by the Kazon? And there's just something strange about her relationship with Neelix and how did it happen? Yeah. And how long did they have together if she doesn't live very long and she's been on the surface of this planet? How did Neelix even come in contact with her? They don't really explain any of that. So that's a little bit strange. I assume that was from Neelix trading with the Kazon. Maybe. This might even have been stranger, but it might have made more sense with a father figure rather than a boyfriend. Oh. But too soon, really, with the information we have to know much about this character. So I don't know what to call this Janeway Leadership Corner. (laughs) That's what's in my notes, so I'll start there. Regarding Janeway, she leads with confidence. Yes. But also they show her having heart. So we know that she isn't the distant leader that Picard was, and they put the burden of the decision on her, and they really only show one person sort of dissenting, and that was Belana, not even a member of her crew. So they don't show anybody yeah. in her crew, you know, arguing with her about it. I would have appreciated maybe a little bit more time, maybe a little less time on the stairs and a little bit more time (laughs) with this decision to see, you know, did she tell them, hey, this is my decision. I don't want to put this burden on anyone else. You know, did they have more of a conversation, at least with her senior leadership, or did she just say, forget it, this is what I decided? I guess a lot of her senior leadership got killed. I guess that was the point of Tuvok. Just that one conversation? Yeah. But I get that for the story, they wanted it all on her. So that made a little bit more sense. But she showed herself in this episode as a pretty confident, effective leader. And I appreciate that. She fulfilled the role of a captain. Yep. And I think it was interesting seeing that development of Picard. If you brought up at the very end of Picard, he realized that he needed those human connections. Yeah, yeah. Here, we saw that scene with Janeway already wanting to have those connections. 
and almost annoyed or disappointed with herself that she hadn't yet taken the time. That she hadn't done it. To do it. Yeah. I think that's all I have to say for now after just one episode about yeah. Leadership Corner and Women in the Future. But <laughs> we will talk about this a lot more. I have no doubt you will. I want to talk briefly here about the characters that we've seen so far and give my personal feeling or notes on them before we get a rating. The first thing is, I find it really impressive seeing Kate Mulgrew and Tim Ross, their respective characters. They seem to get them from the outset, from day mm. one. Yeah. Janeway is exuding Starfleet Captain. And I remember reading before the series started about how Tim Ross but how he wanted to play Tuvok and saying that this is a guy, he doesn't have a human side like Spock. He intended to play him fully Vulcan. I did enjoy that. So I felt we were seeing some characters that were remarkably well-developed, even though this is the first time we're seeing them on screen. But that's just something that I think re-watching that now, it stands out to me. I think the Doctor was pretty much established as the way he's going to be yeah. going forward as well. Yeah. And I liked how they established... The relationship between Harry and Tom and then yeah. the relationship between Harry and Bellana. I thought the, both of those things were done really well. And it was not something that they did very well in the beginning of Deep Space Nine yeah. at all. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought those were big wins. And, and I do agree with what you said about uh, the two main characters at this point. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to rating. What we normally do, if you haven't listened to us before, is yes. just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the episode. So what is your rating? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral? Absolute thumbs up. I really did enjoy this episode. I remember when we watched it originally, and I was like, that was really good. And I will <laughs> stand by that. Yeah, it's a pretty good start. Janeway has established herself as like a little bit Picard and a little bit like Kirk yes. at this juncture, yep. right? A little gung ho. Yep. It's definitely not Deep Space Nine. No. Nope. A little like Strange New World starting while Discovery is still on. You know, it's like, okay, those of you who don't like that kind of Star Trek, well, here's the older school yeah. kind of Star right. Trek, right? And so I, I think it was a good it was a good start because of that. Yep. And it really is quite funny how upbeat and lighthearted the ending is considering <laughs> what happened. <laughs> I mean, that was a very yeah. specific choice that this is the kind of show this is going to be. This might be controversial, but I think it's a better opening to a Star Trek show than TNG or Deep Space Nine. I like the opening to Deep Space Nine. I think this, maybe this is a little bit smoother. I agree this is a better episode than Encounter at Farpoint, yeah. the first episode of TNG. It's also a better episode than <laughs> the pilot of TOS, the one with Pike, and then the first episode without Pike. It's yeah. definitely better than that. I would say it's, it's comparable to the Deep Space Nine start, but this one is a bit more trekky, yeah. is what I would say about it. Uh, yeah, so, okay, yeah, I yeah. would agree with that. All right, well, that wraps up season one, episode one and two, I guess. Congratulations on making it this far, if you've listened this far. If you haven't, you probably wouldn't know I say this. We don't normally talk this long because most of the episodes are shorter, so we will aim to keep the episodes short. Although we have many people who tell us they like longer <laughs> episodes, but I do not like longer recordings. I like us to wrap the show up in an hour. Yeah. Well, come back next week for episode... Three? It seems strange since we've only done one episode. Yeah. Episode two of the podcast. <laughs> In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over analysis of this or any episode as we go along, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us on the social media platforms, that thing that used to be called Twitter. We're there at Rebinge It. We're on Instagram and threads, also at Rebinge It. And you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. We're also on YouTube at Rebinge It. I always forget YouTube. Well, thanks for joining us on this first episode of Rebinge Star Trek Voyager. That's it for me. I don't know. I hate to say the same thing we said at the end of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It's our catchphrase. It is our catchphrase. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 